Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, invisibility, why is the sky blue, light sails, and weird science facts. Coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, episode number 88, recorded on Thursday, March 24th, 2011. Let there be light. Good afternoon or evening or wherever you are. Maybe it's even morning. Hello and welcome to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. I am not Dr. Kiki. That uh, is hopefully uh, abundantly obvious. Dr. Kiki is away on maternity leave, having given birth to a beautiful baby boy just 20 days ago today. So uh, more congratulations to Kiki. And she's been having a series of guest hosts. And today it's me. I'm Brian Mallow. Uh, I am a science comedian. In fact, I am at science comedian on Twitter and on YouTube and, and all those other places, even sciencecomedian.com. And I uh, additionally make science videos for Time Magazine's website. Um, if it comes up, I might tell you a little bit more about that. But on today's show, uh, I think we have a really fun show and interesting. It's going to be about a few different things, but a no pun intended here, but the focus will be about light because my guest is actually an associate professor of uh, optics and uh, physics at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. He is also a very prolific blogger uh, on a couple subjects. He, he likes to blog about physics and optics, but also about science history and uh, and weird science facts. So we will also discuss some weird science facts. He recently completed uh, 365 days of delivering a handful of weird science facts every day. So uh, that's pretty impressive uh, if anyone has tried and failed to be a consistent blogger like me. So uh, let me go ahead and introduce you to my guest. His name is Greg Gabor. Uh, can we get a shot? There he is, Greg. How you doing? All right, here I am. I'm doing and, great. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, uh, I'll also introduce you uh, more completely as uh, the blogger at SkullsInTheStars.com, and he is on Twitter as Doctor Sky Skull. And why don't we give uh, Greg? Uh, a little taste of the power of the Twit Network. He is uh, tweeting at Dr. Sky Skull, and uh, why don't you go follow him there and surprise the hell out of him with the power of the Twit Network. And uh, I'm at, at Science Comedian, so uh, you can follow me as well. And in fact, um, I should say right up front, I just made a blog post at sciencecomedian.com. If you go to the blog, the most recent post has, uh, very brief show notes. Um, I might flesh it out later and put the video from this episode, but you can find some links that we might talk about. Just a couple things, his, his blog and a couple other things. Uh, it's the most recent post at sciencecomedian.com slash blog. All right. So enough introductory remarks. Hello, Greg, and good to see you. Hello. Good to see you too. Yeah. Now, Greg and I, we haven't known each other very long. We met at the Science Online conference which is this awesome annual conference. This was about the fifth annual one. Yep, I believe Fourth so. Yep. Yeah. It was my first. Um, mm. Had you been to it before? Yeah, this was actually my third. Um, the second one that I've actually presented something. Um, last, this year, I presented some things. The year before, I took a break. And the year before that, I presented. And that was my first year. So I think, yeah. I think you're right. I think it's been about five years. And I haven't been to all of them, but I'm kind of close. Yeah, so that's a Science Online. It is a conference in North Carolina and Research Triangle uh, that is about science communication. So there are a lot of scientists there and bloggers 
uh, the scientists that are there are science bloggers as well. So, um, yes, this is a physics of light episode, but we'll also, like I said, um, uh, talk about some weird science facts. So, Greg, let me ask you, first of all, um, just a little background, how, how you came to be a physicist. Did you know you wanted to, did you always know you wanted to be a physicist? Actually, I'm not sure that I knew that I wanted to be a physicist until maybe about the week before I did my <laughs> dissertation defense for my PhD. Um, <laughs> kind of late to it, huh? Because, uh, maybe that's yeah, a lag it, having to do with the finite speed of light. <laughs> it could very well have. It was, it was a weird sort. I've always been interested in science, and I kind of got into physics because I had a really great high school teacher that had a really quirky sense of humor and would just do weird demonstrations in class. And quite frankly, some demonstrations that would not be allowed in uh, this this day and age, <laughs> including electrifying. Yeah. He would actually electric. One day, I remember he tried to. He was electrocuting the students with a little uh, current generator, and. <laughs> Yeah, are you sure uh, that wasn't punishment? That was a... Uh, yeah, it, you know? it was a very odd odd way to do things. And he actually failed to shock me because I was really... I'm actually still very short, but I was really short in high school. And I had a tendency to sit on my leg in my desk chair at, in class. And what he would do is our... our our teacher was just going around with this little current generator and shocking the chair legs, and the current would go up through the rivets in the chair and zap people. And, <laughs> and he didn't realize I was sitting on my legs, so I wasn't touching the rivets. I'm like, come on, do me, do me. And he was kind of trying to zap me, and he kept turning up the current, and I was just sitting there staring at me, and he finally scowled at me and said, okay, we'll get you later. Yeah. You know, I actually had a really good physics class. I went to a good public school in Houston, Texas. It was Bel Air High School. And we had a great physics class with a guy named Dr. Beam. Dr. Beam, what a great science fictional kind of name. <laughs> and he was really tall and skinny. And I remember when he demonstrated um, conservation of angular momentum, he had this great turntable, this large turntable that he put on his desk and he climbed on top of it and with his knees sticking out and his elbows sticking out all sorts of crazy places. He spun himself and had some weights and pulled them in and did what we often see figure skaters do, demonstrating yep. uh, the conservation of uh, angular momentum. And I guess I should say you have a couple really interesting hobbies and one of them is figure skating. Yeah, um, and that actually almost ties back into my not being sure what I wanted to do with my life up through graduate school because it was somewhere about halfway through graduate school. My research wasn't going anywhere, and I was just not feeling too confident about myself. And so I said, the heck with it. I'm just going to start trying all sorts of new weird hobbies. And one of them <laughs> I tried was figure skating. And I just one day I went to the ice rink and decided I liked it and decided to take a class, but since I couldn't figure skate at all, I was put in the beginner class with like the eight-year-old girls. So here I was, this you know, 27-year-old guy in this class with all these eight-year-old girls around. And it was a bit, of a, a bit of a bruise to my ego, but I kind of persevered and, and do pretty good now, I guess. Yeah. That's, uh, so why don't we go ahead and mention the other, the other hobby of yours. And, and Alex, could you get that image ready? Um, Greg, uh, I guess it seems like all your hobbies do have to do with physics because you also skydive. <laughs> You're a skydiver. Yeah, yep, that's right. I jump out of planes. I've done, uh, to date, I've done some 970 skydives. Wow. How long have you been doing it? Uh, well, since, since I was in my mid-20s. So I think I'm in my 13th year of skydiving. Overall. What are we seeing this here? Is... There's that image. Uh, this is a nice picture. It's actually from a video clip that I actually put on YouTube of me jumping out of a hot air balloon. And I had Did a good you have friend to? Who... <laughs> was it an emergency? <laughs> no, it was, it was actually, that's actually kind of one of the uh, delicacies of skydiving is jumping out of a hot air balloon because it's sort of a unique experience. And there's actually yeah. some physics behind that too. Because, uh, and I always say this actually has to do with relativity, that the only time you get a weightless feeling in physics or in the world, in the only time you get a weightless sensation is when you're truly in free fall and there are no other forces acting on you other than gravity. Now, even when you jump out of an airplane, that's not really true. Because when you jump out of an airplane, you have this relative wind because the plane's doing like 100 miles an hour. So there's always a force on you. So you always have some sort of sense of grounding, of like knowing which way things are moving. But when you jump out of a hot air balloon, it's just floating there. And so that's like one of the really the only times that you get this real sensation of being truly weightless for a few seconds. 
Wow. And yeah. The first time I did it, actually, it was so weird that I was like swearing when I left the balloon because it just freaked me out. And, and it's completely <laughs> silent because there's no wind around. And everybody, after I landed, they're like, yeah, we heard you. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> That's amazing. The closest thing I've done, I've never skydived and I, I don't, I, I kind of, I'm starting to suspect that I never will, but, but you never know. Um, but I did fly in a Zeppelin. There's a company oh. in the Bay Area called Airship Adventures at airshipadventures.com. And they oh, have cool. a Zeppelin, it's not a blimp. There is a difference. It's a dirigible, uh, which I think covers all of them, but a Zeppelin actually has some physical, a blimp, if you deflate it, it completely deflates. It's just a, a bag of helium. But um, a Zeppelin, actually made by the Zeppelin, the original Zeppelin company in Germany, it has some structure to it. And because of that, the engines are mounted far from the gondola, so it's very quiet. And it's parked yeah. at NASA Ames. They have some space at NASA Ames down in Mountain View, and I got to ride oh, in it. Cool. It was very cool. Yeah. Oh, very. Yeah, I'm, I'm jealous. I'd love to jump out of it, quite frankly, but yeah, I don't think they let was, me get away with that. <laughs> also, something that was cool that you can't do on an airplane is you can stick your hand out the window. Like you're allowed to, <laughs> you, you, there's a, right. <laughs> which I know this well, probably sounds so windows. You were in a hot air balloon. What is this windows you speak of? <laughs> well, if you're a skydiver, actually, we usually, when you get, when the plane gets to about 2,000 feet, we usually, if it's a hot day, you crack the door open or just throw the door open and then you can just sort of stick your head out the door or kind of lean against the door and look out. It's actually one of the other fun things about skydiving is just saying, yeah, I was just hanging out by an open door of an airplane. Just chilling yeah. out. Well, you know, let's, let's get onto the, to the subject. I love the idea of like, maybe we'd hit some stuff about the physics of everyday stuff as well, but okay. there's a particular topic that you've specialized in. Um, and that is something we've been hearing a lot about the past couple of years. And I think that we should work our way towards it, but it's about invisibility and invisibility cloaks. And uh, so we're going to talk about that a little because Greg actually uh, wrote his PhD dissertation 10 years ago on this subject. And really for most of us, it's something that we've just been hearing about more recently. But um, as we go towards that, I want to ask you, you, you specialize in classical uh, theoretical classical optics. So uh, could you define classical optics for me? For us? Yeah, um, yeah, sure. Um, basically, the history of optics, I mean, if you go back thousands of years, people really looked at light as, you kind of look at light streaming through a window and it just sort of seems like these beams traveling in straight lines. And so originally people thought of light as these sort of rays or these sort of beams. And at first, there wasn't a really clear idea of what that was. And around the time of Isaac Newton, Newton pretty convincingly for people at the time, he thought he had conclusively demonstrated that light, in fact, consists of a collection of particles. That the, when you're seeing light, you're seeing these streams of particles. Well, in the early 1800s, other researchers did experiments a little more carefully and a little more detailed and were able to demonstrate actually light is a wave. Light has wave-like properties. And when people talk about classical optics now, that's really what they're talking about is the idea of light being a wave. And the way, like, can I ask you something? What, sure. what, 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 what was, was there something, anything specific? What was it about that Newton found that indicated that, that, that light would be a particle? Um, a so long of, ago. Yeah. Yeah. A number of things. One of them is if you're familiar with um, refraction, the refraction of light, light goes into a material like water and it, it changes direction. And Newton had a really good explanation for that that said basically that light speeds up. When light crosses a surface, it speeds up in the direction perpendicular to the surface. And that means that these light particles kind of change their direction because they kind of accelerate when they cross the boundary. I like to think about it that kind of what Newton was visualizing was like a particle rolling along. And when it crosses from one material to another, it kind of goes downhill and it mm. speeds up in that direction. And so that was just one example amongst many that he was okay. able to explain what light was doing using this model of it being a particle. Yeah. So then, but then the, the idea that for a long time that stuck is that, that the light is actually a wave and that's classical optics. 
Yeah. And that's to differentiate uh, what happened, I guess, around the early 1900s. Is this? Uh... Yes. That, yeah, that was the turning point is for basically 100 years. And there's sort of a nice kind of symmetry for it that it was really almost literally 100 years from the time that everybody sort of decided that light was a wave that it was started with uh, Mac, Max Planck, who was studying basically how light is emitted from very hot objects or what would be called an ideal black body. And he, he was only able to derive theoretically the correct formula for the way light is emitted by a black body by assuming that light is emitted in these little discrete quantities. And that was kind of the first hint, again, that light actually has some sort of particle nature to it. And then really things that the people really became convinced when Einstein in 1905 published a paper on a topic called the photoelectric effect, where he argued that this photoelectric effect was actually, could be exp only be explained by the idea that light consists of a stream of particles again. And that led to this idea, and that's where we go from classical to modern, is this idea that light has this complementary nature, that there's a wave aspect to it and there's a particle aspect to it. Depending on how you're looking at it and what you're doing with it, it may act like one or the other or both. Right. And I think that, you know, maybe a lot of people, if people even knew that, that Einstein did get a Nobel Prize, they'd probably assume it was for relativity, but it was actually the discovery of the photoelectric effect that got right. him his Nobel. Yeah, it was the explanation of the photoelectric effect. Okay. Um, um, and I guess I should mention what the photoelectric effect is. It was basically this idea that uh, this observation that when you shine light on a metal surface, you could see electrons getting kicked off the surface. And so it was a, a very strange effect that it seemed like light could cause electrons to be ejected from the surface, but only under certain circumstances that couldn't really be explained by the wave model of light that people had been using. And so as Einstein was able to take, there were like a handful of observations that were kind of troublesome for the wave theory. And Einstein sort of said, well, actually I can explain all of these just by simply assuming that light is a, is a particle, has a particle nature. How was it a hundred years ago when you say that they could, when you shine a light on the surface that you could see electrons kicked off? How would they see that a hundred years ago? Um, I, I believe, well, what they did is they had a um, electric potential difference. You have a metal surface and I'm, I'm kind of guessing here because I haven't looked at the original photoelectric effect experiments recently, but I think it was basically it had a potential, an electric potential difference. So you had basically the electrons were in an elect, the I should say the metal surface is in an electric field, so if electrons get kicked off the surface, they naturally kind of form a current. Uh, they're, they're drawn to a, an anode or, a, or another metal surface where they form a current. And so they were basically measuring the current of electrons shooting off the metal surface. Okay. I Hopefully will accept that, that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that much choice, I suppose. But uh, so... Trust me, I'm a scientist. <laughs> so, you know, but, but I guess what it comes out to, so, but light isn't a wave or a particle, really, is it? These are just our models, I guess? Yeah, actually, I, that's not what I often will tell students, as I say. We talk about, we say that light has aspects of both waves and particles, which really means it's not really either. <laughs> and that it's, it's something else that kind of acts like both, but isn't really exactly either of them. And, and I guess there's, actually, a, there's a, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and we're actually still to this day trying to sort out exactly what that means. Yeah, I guess, and there's a classic experiment that really points up the, the weirdness of light. Um, and I don't know how technical we should get, but it's so weird and fascinating. It's the double slit experiment. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and uh, just to, sure. to, to point up how weird light is. Sure. And actually, we have a picture for this, I think, which is young double slit, which kind of shows the layout. Uh, hopefully, they can bring it up for us. Where the idea, and this goes back to Thomas Young in, oops, yeah, that's that pretty much shows it. Thomas Young in basically the early 1800s, the idea was you have a light source that, and this light source is illuminating a screen that has two apertures in it. And when, you, and when light travels through these apertures, you end up seeing, if you have a second screen behind it, 
if you if you assume that light behaves as particles, you'd expect maybe to see one spot of light on the second screen, or maybe two spots of light for light from the two screens. But what you instead see is this this pattern of bright and dark fringes, which we call interference fringes. So there, there's this regular pattern where you see a lot of light at some places and not a lot of light at other places. And then you get and, that weird image of a cursor there. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure Young couldn't explain that in his day. But, uh, <laughs> but so these, these bright and dark fringes are due to the fact that the waves that are being that are emanating from the, di the two pinholes or the two slits, the waves that are emanating from those two slits are interfering with each other. And in some places, they're combining and amplifying each other. And in other places, they're combining and canceling each other out. And that was a very dramatic, clear, unambiguous depiction of the wave nature of light. But... But, in fact, you can also use Young, Young's double slit experiment to show the particle nature of light. And it so happens that I, I fortunately have a, an image of this, too. There's an image, quantum posi double slit, ex, double slit. And this is actually the experimental data that was done um, that was shown somewhere around 1974. Now, what happens here, I have to kind of give a little explanation, is so the double slit experiment, you, you see these fringes, the lower right corner, you see this sort of fringe pattern. Some, there's some light bands and there's some dark bands. But then people started to say, well, if light is also particles, you should be able, what happens if I basically turn down the brightness of my light source to the, to the extent that now most of the time there's only one light particle or photon going through these slits at a time. And the amazing thing is, is that you... You see, and now in the upper left corner, what you see is just what happens when a single photon arrives at your detector. You just see a spot of light. You don't see a wave at all when a single photon goes through. However, suppose you just start adding up the locations where all of these photons go. Well, So you, you keep sending the, individual photons through one at a time. One at a time. And you would think, well, there's only individual particles going through. You won't see an interference pattern. But once you start adding up the locations of all those individual photons, you find that the entire collection of photons creates this interference pattern that we associate with waves. And that's where the whole wave-particle duality thing comes in. Individual photons, when you detect them, they look like particles, but when you consider the behavior of a large number of photons as a whole, they act like they, they give you a wave interference pattern. And I, yeah, that I, doesn't I, seem possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so this one, one photon going through somehow interfering with itself. Yeah, and that's sort of the traditional interpretation of that experiment is that what's really happening is an, every individual photon has its own wave-like properties. And so that individual photon is in some sense some some aspect of that individual photon is in fact going through both of these slits at the same time and then that that individual photon still it gets de detected as a single particle but that wave nature of the fo of the part of light is preserved in where it can end up that that single photon is more likely to end up where a bright spot would be and less likely to end up where a dark spot would be yeah and then making any sense that, at all? <laughs> yeah, you know, the part that I've always had trouble with, too, is there's this idea that then if you put up a detector that, like, in that version right there, you're sending yep. one part, one photon at a time, and it's, and you're not clear which slit it's going through, but if you set up it, and then you get a wave pattern, a different, mm -hmm. uh, an interference pattern, but then if yep. you set up a detector that can determine which slit it goes through, yep. then... Just the fact that you're doing that changes and you no longer get an interference pattern on that back wall. Yep. Yeah, and I think the way, and I, I, I'm not an expert in the quantum stuff, though I'm familiar with it, but I think the way that the modern uh, quantum people would talk about this would say that the key to getting an interference pattern is indistinguishability. That is... If if my detect if if my experiment if I can't if my experiment doesn't set up for a way to detect 
wh where a photon came from, which slit it went through, for instance, then I'll see an interference pattern. And if I do set up the experiment in such a way that there's a way to tell, to tell where the photon went, then it'll have that particle nature. So if I try and determine which slit it goes through with certainty, then it'll definitely go through one slit or the other. Yeah, and this, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing about this, it is obvious, I guess. And so no, look, no, this isn't. is a really classical, so now we're no longer in the realm of classical optics. This is quantum no. theory, quantum mechanics. Yes, that's getting into the, the quantum nature of light. And this is the sort of stuff that, I mean, we, we understand now, I mean, we can model this stuff very well and we can predict very well what will happen in a given experiment, but there's still this sort of philosophical understanding that's eluding us, that there's this sort of big picture that you kind of mentioned that it seems kind of paradoxical and counterintuitive, and it still seems like that to modern physicists. And there still seems to be something missing from the picture, and people aren't completely sure what that is. Yeah. I guess I always like that thing that uh, Richard Feynman said about quantum mechanics that, uh, well, so, somebody has said that if you think you understand it, you don't understand it. But what Feynman, the thing that Feynman at some point said in a lecture was that you have to stop asking why it does this, because we really don't know why the universe is like this, but let's just uh, explore the equations that seem to accurately describe what, what is happening. Yeah, and... and there is a lot of, I mean, in essence, it becomes a lot of philosophy when you start talking about quantum mechanics. And um, you, can, you can spend a lot of time worrying about what does it all mean and, and how, how can we make this theory completely consistent? Or you can go do experiments and not worry about it. And there are people that are doing interesting research kind of on both ends, both ends of the spectrum. People that are just musing over what the heck it all means and other people that are sort of just plodding along and saying, hey, I can predict what's going to happen and I can make my experiments work and I can test whether we can find new, new experiments that show some sort of violation of the theory that we, as we understand it. Yeah. Let, let me ask you something. Let me step back to some classical stuff. One thing sure. that fascinates me about Newton is that, in a, in a sense, he sort of back-engineered white light in, in, in figuring out that white light was composed of all these different colors it's, it's just kind of fascinating that no one knew that before. We kind of take this for granted. And that what that led to was ultimately, now we understand that there's this whole spectrum and, and each part of the spectrum has since been used to tell us so much about that the, so much about the world that we use light for communicating we use light for x-rays we use light mm -hmm. like every for cooking food in a microwave oven for cell phones for light has so many uses and and just the light that's raining down on us from the stars for instance that it's not just light raining down on us it's information and by analyzing each part of the spectrum, we've learned so many different things about the composition of stars, galaxies, the cloud, the, the gas clouds in between. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, it, I mean, it, it's sort of funny to look back that that understanding of the, the, how, in essence, diverse electromagnetic waves is what we'd call them in general. Light is just visible light that we see with our eyes is a small subset of general electromagnetic waves, which include X-rays, ultraviolet, infrared, and so forth. And going back and looking at the history, you can see all of these things were detected, discovered independently, and it took a, a healthy amount of time before everybody kind of convinced themselves that these were all just manifestations of the same sort of phenomena. Yeah. Like we think of heat, we, you don't like it's it's hard to 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 see the equivalence between heat and uh, and visible light, uh, yeah, blue light. Or something. Hey, let me ask yeah. you something because this has always yep. been so controversial. Uh, <laughs> cell phone radiation. Um, can there possibly be any danger from it holding this device right up against our? Now I know that there's another basic physics issue here, which yep. is the inverse square law. That right. <laughs> that. Even if, if this device might be completely harmless a foot away, but when you put it right up against your brain, uh, you're increasing the intensity of the dose you're getting uh, by the square. of, And then that's quite right. a difference from 12 inches to less <laughs> than an inch. That's a huge yeah. increase. Yeah, well, the, the, big, the big distinction and the big, the, I mean, 
there's always a possibility, but as we understand the laws, as, as we understand the science right now, it's not that big a concern. The biggest concern that people would have always had about these sort of things is, well, will these cell phones give me cancer? And it turns out that the defining, the defining characteristic in that case is not the intensity of the radiation, but the, the wavelength or the frequency, how, how quickly it oscillates. Right. And a shorter wavelength is equi equals a higher energy. And now to really cause, to have a kind of cancer causing element, you need to have very high energy radiation like x-rays or potentially ul or ultraviolet x-rays or cosmic rays. And sort of the radio waves and microwaves, they can do other bad things to us, but they don't, they don't break DNA to the best of our knowledge. Now, there, there are other issues in I've heard people talk about concerns about maybe maybe there could be some sort of secondary heating issue involved with cell phones, right. but at least as far as I've seen, there's been no scientific evidence that's really shown any sort of definite connection. And when when you have to work really hard to show a definite connection, um, that usually means that there may still be a concern, but not a really big concern. At least right, that's my way of thinking obvious. about it. And there, it's also my understanding that we've been using cell phones for quite a while now and there hasn't yet been any kind of increase in the incidence of brain tumors. Yeah, that was, that was something else that I would have brought up is that you, if, you, if you look at the big picture, you'd think that you'd see huge, since cell phone use has spiked tremendously, you'd think that there would be some sort of correlation with an increase in some yeah. sort of brain or head-related problems. And as I understand it, again, I don't think there's been much of a connection there. No, the bigger problem is having to listen to annoying people on the phone uh, in public. But, uh, <laughs> and getting now, my so calls dropped all the time by my carrier, yeah. We're also getting into this area where it's not necessarily a field where, where physics intersects with biology, but, um, but, but since we are there, are you one of those physicists that believes that all science reduces to physics, biology and chemistry are physics? Um, in, the, in the crudest... In the crudest possible manner, you could say so. But the reality is, is that physics, chemistry, biology, we're all trying to solve different problems at different levels. Now, the thing is, is, yeah, in principle, the laws of physics can explain everything in chemistry. However, when we do physics, we're usually dealing with one particle or a couple of particles at a time in, in, our, mod, in our theoretical models and our computational models. And... When you start building up to really complicated systems, you need another approach. And so it's sort of like we're, chemists are really dealing with problems on a different level. And it's not a, it's not a, a more primitive level or a more advanced level. It's really a, a different set of problems. Yeah. And biologists are doing that too. Now, one thing I like to say is that Kind of the fascinating thing that you see, especially in the last 20 years, is that all these fields are starting to overlap more and more. And that kind of it used to be biologists had their thing they were doing, chemists had their thing, and physicists had their thing, and there wasn't a lot of crossover. And, and now the, the definitions of what we consider biology, chemistry, and physics have started to overlap so much that you find all of the people from these different disciplines are talking to each other all the time. Um, People in my department, we have biophysicists in my department. Um, my people in my department, we talk with biologists, we talk with the chemists, they talk back to us. So, I mean, it's it's almost reaching the point where the boundaries are are, are really getting pretty fuzzy between these disciplines. So, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say. So, I I try not to have that sort of snooty attitude of saying, <laughs> oh yeah, it's all just physics, because really I couldn't do the stuff that biologists and chemists are doing right. with my physics knowledge anyway. Well, let me ask you one more biology thing. Have you ever heard this? Um, it's it's my understanding that uh, you know we that we have a limited what we call visible light is because our vision is limited and we can only see with our eyes, a small part of the spectrum. And that there's one reason that that's necessary, and that is that um, because the different wavelengths or frequencies refract different amounts when they, when they go through a lens, the light passing through the lens of our eyes that needs to focus on the retina, if we saw too broad a part of the spectrum, it wouldn't all be in focus at the same time. So, so it's limited so that it can all be reasonably close to being focused at the same time. 
Now, and that's not really what my question is, but it's that <laughs> I've, I heard that that are the cones that see color actually can perceive a little higher into what we would call the ultraviolet, because of course that's mm -hmm. a relative term, and that the lens of our eye has a yellow discoloration that cuts out some of that. But some people mm. have had cataract operations, they've had the lens removed and replaced mm. with a clear lens, and afterwards they were able to see into the ultraviolet. Have you ever heard anything like that? Um, not too much. I'm going to make a note for my weird science facts later. But, yeah. Um, I'd love I, to I know have, if that turns out to be true. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I have heard that, I, I believe that some people actually do have an additional set of, of cones in their eye, that some people have sort of extra visual capabilities. Mm. Not so much that you'd really notice per se. It seems to be an evolutionary uh, leftover. But I have heard of people having an additional distinct set of cones. Interesting. And, and there's also, there's also other unusual aspects of our vision that um, come up, like polarization sensitivity. Light, light is a transverse wave, as we call it, which means it's kind of like that it wiggles up and down instead of, instead of front to back in the direction of motion. Okay. And that's what we call polarization, that you can, you can have, like, like when you wiggle a phone cord, if anybody still ever uses those coiled phone cords, <laughs> you can wiggle it up or down or left or right. So there are two different ways or anywhere in between that you could wiggle it to get waves. And light is like that too. And it turns out, that's what we call polarization. And it turns out some animals still have or have polarization sensitivity because it turns out to help them see things. And it also turns out that people still have a built-in polarization sensitivity in their eyes, which is very, very faint. And it's called Heidegger's brush is the actual image you see that, and some people can see it, I can't, but you, you actually do have a little bit of polarization sensitivity in your eyes too that doesn't get used. I like that, that the idea of also like as we study biological forms and, and maybe adapt biological technology into our synthetic technology. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about invisibility. And you know, when you wrote about it 10 years ago, you weren't the first person to hit this subject. In fact, it's actually a pretty old subject, huh? Oh, yeah. Um, and Not just H.G. Days... Wells either, right? <laughs> no. Um, it's kind of fun that the fiction authors and the physicists started to really look at these sort of things around the same time, it seems, that um, and the fiction authors were a little bit ahead that they were actually trying to come up with explanation, scientific explanations for invisibility a few years before the physicists were. But it actually does go back at least 100 years. I'm still trying to look and see if I can find even earlier papers. I, I'm, I'm not convinced that I've, got, I've found everything yet that there is to see. And I've I've found stuff going back as early as kind of 1881 or 1882 where people have talked about some sort of invisibility. Right. So when now, and also, so now what we're talking about in recent years, it's not, uh, we're not even talking about trying to cloak a human, uh, make an invisible human. It's all happening on a very small scale, right? Yeah. Um, and it actually, the whole invisibility topic, and it's, it's actually kind of hard to see the connection at first, but it really started in the pre, right about the era that quantum mechanics started up, the early 1900s. And what happened is, is that people didn't know anything about the structure of the atom, or they knew almost nothing about the structure of the atom. All they really knew, well, they knew a few things, but kind of they knew that atoms were neutrally charged, and they knew that they had electrons in them, and they were pretty sure that these electrons, these negatively charged particles, were moving around inside the atom. Now, this, this was a really big problem for theor theoretical physicists because people already knew at that point that if you have a charged particle, if you take a charged particle and you accelerate it, it gives off radiation. And in fact, this is now an application, this is ter was originally a problem at particle accelerators that shoot charged particles around in a big circle because these electrons or these charged particles were going around in a circle, going around in a circular path is you're accelerating constantly inward to stay in a circular path. And so you get X-rays that are radiating out and that's synchrotron radiation. 
And now they use that for actual experiments. They use those x-rays for uh, medical purposes, among others. But so there was this big problem that people knew that accelerating particles should be giving off radiation. But atoms weren't just radiating all the time. They were just sitting there happy as can be. And so one of the big problems was, well, why aren't they doing this? And it, it turned out it was around 1910 that uh, Paul Ehrenfest, who is another kind of giant of physics of the era, pointed out that, okay, he, what he said is, we tend to think of electrons as these point particles. And if you have a point particle that's accelerating, well, then it's going to give off radiation. But if you assume that the electron is actually some extended distribution of charge, that it's actually not a point, it's like a sphere of charge, then you can actually find, it's all in the math, you can actually find solutions where this charge is moving and accelerating, but it doesn't give off any radiation. And this was sort of a really fascinating idea, but it was almost completely forgotten immediately because in 1913, Niles Bohr came up with this sort of quantum model of the atom, and everybody suddenly realized, oh, there's this, actually, there's new physics involved. There's this whole quantum mechanical thing. And so Ehrenfest's idea was, was forgotten. But it's, it turns out that the mathematics of this idea of what we, I now call a non-radiating source or a non-radiating current distribution is directly tied to this idea of invisibility. And loosely speaking, you can say an invisible object is an object that should scatter light, but it doesn't. A non-radiating source is an object that should radiate light, but doesn't. And mathematically, they're very closely connected to one another. Okay. So that idea, like maybe we could pull up one of those images that, uh, that shows what, what the concept is in getting uh, an object to appear invisible. Okay, there's a, yeah, the optical cloak image is sort of the classic one. And, ah, yeah, there it is. And this, this was, and uh, the funny thing is, is that I did my work on invisibility stuff, got my PhD in 2001. But one of the things that I never really delved too far into it, because there was a theorem that had been published in 1988 that said that perfect invisibility is impossible, that it can't be done. And... I was kind of surprised and taken aback in 2006 when this optical cloak idea came out and if we could see the picture again. So this group, two groups actually came up with the same sort of idea at once. And the idea here, and the, the, the dark lines represent this sort of ray picture of light. They've got like little rays or beams of light entering this cloak and the cloak is this sort of outer sphere. And now what it is, is the cloak is this sort of shell of material that's designed in such a way that when light shines on it, it actually gets diverted around the central region and comes out the other side in its original trajectory. As if it had, as if it had just gone straight through that region and had never encountered anything at all. And this is exactly what the idea of a cloak is, is that I could put something in the middle of that cloak and light rays would go completely around it. They'd never see that interior object. And in fact, the entire cloak would not be visible because the light rays would have essentially would have been kind of, they go about their business. They, it's, you know, like a policeman waving them, alo waving them along and saying, nothing to see here, move along. Right. Which so it's an analogy. It, I just thought of, I'm really proud of it now. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything, so is there any chance theoretically that this could, could even exist on the macro level, a cloak that, that I could wear that uh, would render me invisible in all directions? Um, theoretically it's possible, but there are a lot of practical issues that are, I mean, the laws of physics as it stands now we're pretty convinced that the laws of physics don't preclude this happening. On the other hand, in order to make this sort of perfect cloak, you'd need to have, you'd need to be able to design this thing uh, very precisely on a, on a scale, on, on almost the atomic level, that you'd have to be able to manipulate materials on the atomic level. And you'd have to make a you have to be able to build something man-sized, a man-sized cloak, and you'd have to be able to tweak that man-sized cloak, the, the properties of it, at, at basically every other atom or so. And it would have to be very specific to like, like your cloak and my cloak. My, my cloak might not render you completely invisible. 
Hey, it, it sort of depends on the way it was done. Like this, this cloak that we showed the picture of, this Pendry cloak, in principle, it would work for anybody equally well. But um, there are a lot of difficulties in making that, and you'd also... You'd, you'd be running around in a big kind of <laughs> ham, hamster ball all day, which might not be the most practical sort of invisibility either. No, I don't know uh, if you could even fit that into the girls' locker room. <laughs> <laughs> no, probably not. Which it not. seems to be the main use of invisibility. Uh, As cloaks. it stands, probably. <laughs> <laughs> As it stands. I always thought that the most annoying thing about being the invisible man must be just people bumping into you because they don't see you. You have to avoid that. Uh, yeah, exactly. It would be... Uh, and. I mean, there are a lot of practical issues involved, and one of them is, yeah, that one of them is from that picture that, yeah, the light all goes around you, but there's a real problem that if you're trying to spy on somebody, you need light to see. So if all the light goes oh. around you, you can't see anything. Oh, so, that's right. So you can't become, even, ah, so your eyes are, are not useful in this situation even. You're yeah. not getting, the light is all designed to, to go around you and not interact with you. Hmm. Yeah, and... And there are ways to get around that. Among them, you could have invisibility doesn't have to be perfect. And this was another sort of slap my forehead moment when these, um, these papers came out about optical cloaking because I was always obsessed by this idea that somebody had said that theoretically perfect cloaking or invisibility is impossible. And then uh, a very smart guy who wrote one of these original papers, I talked to him in 2003, said, well, why does it have to be perfect? If, if I can make myself you know, 99% invisible, that'd be pretty good. I'm sure I could get yeah. a lot of mileage out of that. And it was one of those moments I was like, yeah, I really hey, haven't yeah. thought of that. Now I feel kind of dumb. You know, that's also, with the invisible man, I guess it, it occurs to me that uh, whatever he had, it's not, let's say they had something that a, a, a potion that they drank that rendered them invisible. And I wondered if, how would photons interact with their retina? So, so yeah. how would he see in that situation? Yeah, and I don't. I, I just recently reread uh, the Invisible Man, and I don't remember whether they act, he actually addressed that or not. But that would be that would be a problem because if the light rays just go all the way through you, then there's nothing to interact with. Right, but, which brings up one of my favorite subjects. Actually, do you do do bad do uh, do you get irritated by bad science in science fiction films or any film? But maybe it's mostly science fiction. And is there <laughs> is there anything? Uh, I wonder if you have any examples. I didn't. I could have asked you that before. Um, it, but, uh, it actually, I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty easygoing about that. It, it really depends on how bad, right? Um, because there, there's sort of they're sort of bad on the level of, well, I need to kind of bend the laws to make my plot work. And then there's kind of mind-numbingly bad where you say any person on the street re realizes that this is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I'm trying to think of some examples. I'm sure I can come up with tons of them in the future. But, I mean, something yeah, yeah. like the, the movie The Core where they've got people <laughs> traveling – tunneling to the Earth's core to set off a nuclear bomb or two to start, start the Earth's core spinning again, which, first of all, you, there, there's, no, there's no way anything on Earth would be able to survive that. And I'm sure they had explanations for it, and I don't remember what they are, but it just jumps out at you as too much, too much of a stretch for me. Yeah. Not to, not to mention kind of, you know, us being able to do something on any sort of finite scale in order to influence something as massive as the Earth's core to begin with. Right. And, you know, I'm yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, no, uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, you know, another uh, device that I'm, I'm sure I first encountered in science fiction that uh, involves light is the light sail um, as a method of propulsion. And we've, it's no longer science fiction. We've actually launched, uh, the Japanese and uh, NASA have launched a couple experiments with light sails in, in orbit uh, around the yeah. Earth. And that's something that is so bizarre the idea that light could, uh, that has momentum and could impart it to a device like that. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's really a fascinating topic because there's, um, the momentum of light was actually when Maxwell in kind of the 1860s kind of postulated that light was actually an electromagnetic wave, he was the guy that went back and said, not only can I show it's an electromagnetic wave, but I can also show you that it has momentum. So we've known about the momentum of light for pretty much 150 years, but it's only over the past 20, 30 years that we've started to realize we can actually do some very interesting things with it. And one of those is in the, on, the, on, the, on a large scale is the idea of a solar sail, that we can put a big 
uh, put a big sail on a spaceship and then it can be pushed away from the sun by the radiation pressure from the sun. Now, on a, on a microscopic sa scale, and I think I have a, an image of this too, there's an idea that came out in late 70s, early 80s called optical tweezing. And optical tweezing is the idea that if you actually tightly focus a beam of light, that beam of light will actually trap particles, yeah, there it is, at the focus. So, and it, what's really not intuitive is that you can actually, the particle will get pulled into the focus of the light beam from any direction. And this has become a great tool for manipulating microscopic particles. And it's used in biology. You can move around cells. You can use it to assemble microscopic structures. And that's called optical tweezing. And this has become a, a mainstream technique that all relies on the fact that light has, light has momentum and it can apply these forces to other objects. Yeah, that's... Uh... And then you told me there's something new that uh, I think maybe uh, this is a pretty savvy audience and we most people have heard of light sails. But yep. again, on a very microscopic level, there's a, there's a new development relating to this? Yes, it's what's now called a light wing or an, or an optical wing. And essentially what it is is that somebody, actually a colleague of mine and some of his colleagues, realized that if you take an, a... a basically a microscopic particle that's got sort of a wing shape to it that a light beam shining on it can generate lift on the particle and make it essentially fly on a beam of light much like an airplane flies on air and ah that's great i was just going to ask for that picture that i mean an airplane wing in essence it's actually a complicated process how it flies but the 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 simple version is just to say that when the the air travels over the wing when it reaches the other side, it gets directed downward. And then by conservation of momentum, the wing has to go up. The air goes down. Some of the air goes down. The wing has to go up. Well, you can do the same thing with a, an irregularly shaped particle in a light beam. This particle will scatter light in different directions. And if it scatters light more in one direction than another, it can make the particle move in a direction contrary to the direction that the light beam is going. When you tend to think of a solar sail, you think, well, the solar sail kind of goes away from the sun in general because that's the way the light is pushing it. But with this idea of a microscopic light wing, you can actually direct the forces and you can have the wing move in a direction contrary to the direction the light is moving. And I think there's a, an image of a, uh, that's called light wing, which is actually an experimental image that kind of shows us an action kind of crudely that... What they did is they illuminated this sort of weird-shaped particle. And this is a time-lapse photo that they illuminated this particle from below. And so you'd think that if light's pushing it from below, it should move upward. But it actually moves to the side, kind of up to the left, because it's got this optical lift to it that's pushing it sideways. And this was just sort of a really nice, simple experiment, very concise idea. And this... Actually, one of the things that they've suggested is that this might actually be able to be used in solar sails because it would be a way of changing the direction. If you put a bunch of these little particles in a solar sail and you could control their orientation, it might be a way to change the direction of motion of the solar sail without having to tilt the whole darn sail. Nice. Hey, you know, you're mentioning you know, scattering. One, I wanted to bring up something about... Uh, the classic question of why is the sky blue? And ah. again, a lot of people know that it, it has to do with scattering of light waves and the blue, the little blue light waves are scattered the most. Um, this is a weird science fact. Um, and maybe we could, we don't have that much time left, but maybe we could discuss sure. some weird science facts. Albert Einstein sure. is actually involved. Um, do you know about Einstein's involvement with the, the subject of why is the sky blue? Um, I don't know that I'm familiar with that one as much. You know what? It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's that um, even when they figured out that it's the, that the blue waves were being scattered the most, so we see them uh, from all yep. directions, um, it was not known whether it was particles of dust in the air causing the oh. scattering or if it was the molecules in the air. And I guess it was Einstein who did the hmm. calculation that showed, I think it's uh, nitrogen molecules that are just the right size to cause the okay. scattering. So okay, that, um, just that an interesting addition to why is the sky blue, Einstein's involved. <laughs>
<laughs> yep, and and he's he's done so much. It's kind of insane when you go back and look at all the things that he actually did. Most of which most people don't even know about, but very right. important. Yeah, the other invisibility thing is weird. Is that you know vampires are supposed to be invisible in mirrors, but I always yep. wondered how come their clothes are invisible to mirror in mirrors. Like, <laughs> what is it? What is it? That the special property about vamp? Do they get them at tailors that? cater to the vampire client. They only stay open from dusk till dawn. They cater to the vampire client and tell. And like, if you wore a vampire's clothes, would that render you invisible in a mirror, perhaps? Or uh, if a vampire wore your clothes, would he just look silly? You know? I, These I, are the I smell questions that keep me I, 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 I smell a grant proposal in the writing. <laughs> Maybe you could help me with that. So now, um, uh, as I mentioned before, my guest, Greg Gabor, uh, is Dr. Sky Skull on Twitter. And 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 where do, what is the in your blog skulls in the stars what's the significance in that skulls in the stars um well part of what i do is i actually blog i started my blog to blog about kind of physics and optics but also my other my other love is kind of weird fiction pulp fiction horror fiction of like the 1920s and 30s and one of my favorite authors is robert e howard who actually wrote the conan the barbarian stories and a lot of other things and one of the stories that he wrote which is one of my favorites is called skulls and the stars and the story is really about a sort of black and white moral moral hero who's forced to make a very gray shades of gray moral decision to solve a problem and somehow that just struck me as sort of a great theme for a blog in overall and since then i've kept the name because one of the things i've learned once i started diving into my the weird fiction of that era is that a lot of these these fiction writers of that era were also really deeply in touch and very interested in the science of the time so Einstein's relativity theory, his special relativity came out in 1905. His general theory was, I think, 1919, if I remember. And this presented a really bizarre new, new vision of the way the universe works, the idea of curved space and time and time not being an absolute. And a lot of authors, people like H.P. Lovecraft, you can see it in their writing. H.P. Lovecraft actually attended uh, lectures on relativity theory. And so a lot of these ideas ended up getting getting into his fiction and so it's also fun from a history of science point of view to see that there is this connection between the the fiction and the science in that era and still to this day yeah that's something that we don't see much today it's like back in the 1850s people like like uh louis pasteur and i don't know exactly when faraday was but when they gave public lectures they were very well attended we have very yeah. few scientists that can draw that kind of crowd thousands like yeah, hundreds and, and hundreds of people yeah one of my favorite weird science facts was an anecdote that kind of in the 1850s when uh, michael faraday was doing public lectures on electricity and magnetism the royal institution where he'd lecture the the roads would get the traffic would be so backed up going in and out of the the institute that they would actually have to make all the streets one way in and one way out when it ended which is funny because i live in nascar territory and that's exactly what they do for nascar <laughs> events these days and i'm not really sure how to interpret that or how to take that. Does, that. does that mean NASCAR operates, like occupies the same position in our ecology that a Faraday lecture used to in the 1850s? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm not completely sure. And I really don't, I, I try not to think about it too much, really. <laughs> that doesn't seem complimentary to our culture. Um, no, it tell doesn't. Me what, yeah, what's another weird science fact? So you've been blogging these weird science facts and, and not just one a day for the past year, but a handful a day. Um, um, usually, uh, usually I try and do just one a day, but sometimes more people contribute stuff, and so okay. sometimes I'll get more. <laughs> but I like usually I try to stick. Sorry. Recently, it was the highest G force survived by a human, and it was over. It was forty six point two Gs. Yes. Yeah, and that was just sort of insane because we tend to think that fighter pilots tend to experience up to nine Gs, and up until that era that this guy was doing this, and I think this was the 1950s, that it was basically thought that if you experienced more than like 15 Gs, you, you were dead, that survivability was like 19 Gs. And so there was this test pilot, and in that era there were a lot of insane test pilots. And so he was doing these rocket sled tests where they'd strap them to a rocket sled and just fire them up to a high rate of speed and then slam on the brakes. And he just kept going higher and higher and hit 46.2 Gs. <laughs> and he Which, lived. 
Yeah, and he broke he broke a lot of bones in the process apparently, and detached some retinas along the way. But uh, he yeah he survived, and that that was a that was groundbreaking for the Air Force to understand what people could survive. Yeah, tell me something about Komodo dragons. Oh, that was one of my favorite ones that I found out was Komodo dragons are well known to eat anything and everything, but. There are limits because they will eat the intestines of any creature, which is usually a bad idea because intestines are filled with, with crap. But the Komodos have a unique solution to that. They'll rip the intestines out of the animal and they'll shake them around and fling them around to get all the poop out before they eat them. And, yeah, and there was something about um, young adolescent uh, Komodo dragons. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Is this, they basically, don't they cover themselves in feces as well just to avoid being eaten by the, the, the adults? Because yeah, the adults so adult Komodo dragons will eat the young? Yeah, <laughs> they'll eat yep. their young? Yeah, in a they'll pinch, really I them, guess. But, uh, and actually, it's one of my favorite episodes of uh, the late Steve Irwin's Crocodile Hunter show is when he, um, when he went to visit Komodo dragons. And... Now, he generally will tell you that, you know, most of these animals are, or most animals are not that mean, even these predators, you can understand them, but the Komodo dragon chased him up a tree. He, like, scratched his leg, the Komodo smelled blood, and it just chased him up a tree. It had to spend a little time up there before it gave up on him. And they're, they're wonderful any... animals, but... Sorry. When, since we talked about Newton some, do you have any weird science facts about Newton? Um, Newton was crazy. One of the best is, uh, I can put in a plug for, for friend Tom Levinson, who just wrote a book, Newton and the Counterfeiter, um, that came yeah. out, I, I think a little over a year ago that Newton, after he finished all of his physics stuff, he got sick of it and decided to go fight crime. He became the warden of the Royal Mint and hunted down counterfeiters. And there's a, there's a great story there that, uh, Tom Levinson's book covers, Another thing about Newton is that when he was a kid, apparently he liked to terrify the locals by flying kites at night that had lanterns in them. So people would see lights <laughs> in the sky, would get terrified and run off. Excellent. Uh, in 1504, Columbus used a lunar eclipse to frighten Jamaican natives and keep his stranded crew <laughs> fred. <laughs> yeah, I, I, thought, I thought you might recognize that one yeah that was um, when he reached when they reached jamaica the natives at first thought that they were more or less some sort of you know divinity and so they they fed them very well and treated them very well but europeans are pigs and compared to the natives and so the europeans were eating the natives out of house and home and at some point the natives said forget it we're not going to give you anything anymore and columbus was really worried because the natives outnumbered him uh, but fortunately, he looked through his almanac and he knew that there was going to be a lunar eclipse coming. So he went out to the chiefs and he said, okay, you guys don't want to feed me anymore. You've angered the gods and the gods are going to swallow the moon tomorrow night. <laughs> and the, natives, the natives were like, yeah, whatever. We don't believe you. And sure enough, the next night, the moon started to disappear. and The natives freaked out and they ran back to Columbus and begged him to bring the moon back. And he knew his timing, and so he kind of waited for the full eclipse, and then he came out and said, okay, over the next hour or so, the, uh, the gods have heard your pleas, and they'll, they'll bring the moon back. And sure enough, the moon reappeared, and Columbus and his men were well-fed for the rest of their stay. See, now this is a perfect example of why it's very useful to have a solid <laughs> science education, right? Exactly, exactly, it's, yes. It's practical. <laughs> Yeah, and and there's yeah there's there's a lot of circumstances like that where the more you know it can help you. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know what's another. There, I see that there. I mean, you have them in every kind of science. There's one about a bacterium so large that it can be seen with the naked of a naked eye. That's pretty cool. Yep. yep. Um, and another recent one I did was that one of the fastest growing um, uh, sp uh, creatures on the planet is a species of kelp that can actually grow. I believe it's up to two feet per day. It's a linear growth of this kelp, which if you think about it, that means that it's really like an inch an hour, which is pretty close to being able to sit there and watch it grow. Wow. And, and yeah, and I, Without I time lapse photography. Without <laughs> time lapse photography, you could actually just sit there and watch it grow and you'd still probably be bored, but not quite as bored as you would be watching other plants grow. Hey, this is kind of a weird science fact. And, and, and since we do have such a techie crowd, you're actually the author of, of a textbook called yep. Mathematical Methods for Optical Physics and Engineering. 
Yes. Uh, is that even, is it out yet? Is it? Yes, it came out just a month ago, and I think I have a picture of that that I sent over, too, if there's a Math Methods picture, if I can plug my book. Yeah, I, I wrote a, a textbook. It's for under, advanced undergraduates and graduates on mathematical methods for, for basically for people who study optics. And there are a, a billion textbooks out there on mathematical methods for physicists. And I've been teaching a class on mathematics for graduate students for like six years, and I realized that a general physics book on math doesn't really explain things the way I want to explain it as an optics person. So I tried to write a book that would be more focused on optics people and would also draw a lot of justification and examples from optics. So I try not to just teach the math, but also say, hey, this is what this mathematical, abstract mathematical gobbledygook would be used for in an optical application. Excellent. And the thing took me forever to write, incidentally. Do you teach from it? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. This fall, I will, probably. Oh, because you're teaching a different class. Yeah, I, it's been frustrating because I've, I've been kind of thinking about writing this book for six years. And about three years ago, I got a contract to write it. And then I found that the thought of writing a book is a lot different from actually <laughs> writing a book. And so, yeah, I've been watching year by year going by going, gosh, if I only had this textbook, I could just give it to you students and it would explain things so much better. And so I'm kind of tired of teaching the math methods course, but I've vowed to teach it at least one more time so I can actually use the actual book in action and as a physical copy, as opposed to notes that I've handed yeah. out to the students. Right. Here's another science fact. I saw the largest recorded beaver dam recorded yes. on February 24th. <laughs> yeah, somewhere, in, and I forget exactly where it is in Canada, but it's something like 2,700 feet. Yeah. which, if you think about that in football fields, is a lot. Yeah, it's and, over nine football fields, you said. <laughs> yeah, and um, as I understand it, there was more than one beaver family that was involved in the construction of this. Otherwise, there's some really big beavers out there, but... Maybe there, maybe it's a big beaver family, like Catholics or something. <laughs> uh, who knows? Um, there's that thing that I guess we all heard about this, though, the getting x-rays from scotch tape. That's that's yep. pretty bizarre, but it got a lot of press uh, earlier this past year or so. Yeah, I I uh, did write a I wrote a big blog post on that when that finally came out because it is it is weird enough to talk about. It's something very mundane object that can produce very high energy X rays, but fortunately only if you have it in a vacuum. So you can kind of wrap your Christmas presents safely, and that was. Actually, part of the reason I wrote the blog post is I'm afraid that people are going to read this and then stop using scotch tape altogether. Right. If you're in a vacuum and you're pulling the scotch tape and generating x-rays, the x-rays probably aren't your, the, the, your top concern. They're probably <laughs> not, yeah. Hey, I would hate to do a whole show without mentioning Abraham Lincoln. So there he's mentioned. And you have a pretty bizarre fact here about how he tried to square the circle. Yes, I'd almost forgotten about that one. That, Yeah, um, squaring the circle is something that we now know to be impossible. And I'm going to forget the exact precise definition of how it's done. It's finding a, finding a circle that has the same, being able to draw a circle that has the same area as a given square or vice versa. I'm kind of forgetting which way it goes. But it was a problem right. that obsessed mathematicians and scientists and ordinary people for years and apparently in his younger days abraham lincoln was one of the guys who said occupied his time trying to figure out how to do it and it's one of those problems that it was well defined enough and easy enough to try that lots of people took a shot at it because it was sort of one of those outstanding problems of mathematics that nobody could figure out and abraham lincoln that that, that it's like <laughs> In his spare time, I guess when he he wasn't trying to keep a handle on the Civil War, yeah. he was trying to square the circle. I, yeah. I know that uh, Lincoln also, I believe, was responsible for the creation of the National Academies. Um, I don't I, I? That may be true. I don't remember. I don't know yeah. that off the top of my head. I can so give you one I guess other a science lover. Yeah, I can give you one other fun fact about the founding of America. Now that I think about it, um, and this was sort of a great one, is that. And this involves Thomas Jefferson, that in the era when the, right around after the, the country was founded, there was a big debate among naturalists about the animal life of the New World. And there was a French naturalist, the Comte de Buffon, 
or buffon. I, I don't want to say buffoon. I'm going to anger all the French speakers out there. <laughs> that uh, the Comte de Buffon, he 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 had this theory that in fact New World animals were sort of sickly and degenerate and sort of inferior to the Old World animals. And now Thomas Jefferson was enough of a, a science buff himself to know that this wasn't true, and it also had political implications because. This was, uh, you know, the, the United States was a fledgling country, and this idea of, well, everything's weaker and lamer in the New World was not really what the American government wanted to have. So Thomas Jefferson's solution is he had somebody go and shoot a bull moose, one of these gigantic moose that we have in, in I believe, the West, and ship its carcass to uh, Buffon just to say, hey, look, we've got these huge animals here. Don't, don't, be, knock, don't be dissing on our, our animal life. <laughs> and I don't, I don't recall whether the Comte de Buffon was completely convinced, but I think it at least quieted him down a bit about this, this whole argument. Yeah. Well, let's, um, uh, we'll have to wrap things up, but um, just one or two little things about light. There's something that fascinates me that I wanted to ask you about, which is it's, it's the, the thing I said before about how all this light that's raining down on us from the rest of the universe, from every direction, from stars and, and other objects, um, and, and, and the, the material in between a star and us, it, it fascinates me that, that we're able to determine the composition of these distant objects because every element has a different signature. It just struck me as odd that, that no two elements happen to have an indistinguishable optical signature. Does, right. that, does that seem odd? You know, when you, when you phrase it that way, it kind of does seem odd. I mean, there's nothing that, there's nothing that's, there's no law that necessarily says, I believe, that, that two atoms or materials couldn't imprint, that, that identical spectra of light, of, of atoms, I should say, implies identical atoms. Right. Um, but um, I think it just comes down to the fact that atoms are complicated and they, they are really different from one another. <laughs> Yeah, um, but, I think, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, but that is one of the very important tools we have in optics and in astronomy is that, yeah, when you get to even molecules, it turns out that molecules are complicated enough that the, the light that gets scattered off of even their vibrational excitations, that molecules tend to vibrate like kind of beat balls on, a, on springs and stuff, and the vibrational... Um, spectra of molecules are distinct enough that they're used for very sensitive detection of different molecules and chemicals. That's called Raman spectroscopy. And so that, that non-uniqueness of, or that uniqueness of elements and molecules is very important in physics. Yeah. I, like the idea, it's like as staring, stargazing. Sometimes it fascinates me that like you could, let's say you're watching the sky at night and there's a light. Let's say there's a star a hundred light years away. It's traveled trillions of miles. And then right before it gets your eye, it hits a cloud instead. I always think there's something a little tragic about that. <laughs> and, yeah, it, and is, it, it is kind of a shame. <laughs> yeah. But can light, it seems unbelievable that light could travel... Can it travel infinitely far that it's self-propagating and it, and it, uh, not, it just keeps going? In, in, to some extent, in principle, yes. I mean, when you think of light as a wave, it hardly seems like it, that the wave gets weaker and weaker as it spreads out. But from a particle point of view, it's just a particle moving along, traveling at the speed of light with a certain amount of energy. And that, if you... The one thing you do have to neglect, though, is the expansion of the universe and the gravity of things in the universe because uh, that tends to affect light that's propagating long distances. But, um, and I'm not sure how cosmologists would answer that. It turns into a question for cosmologists is can light go on forever or will it hit the end of the universe or will it run out of steam before it hits the end? Don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, but you're not the only one. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I'm not the only one. Olber's paradox. Do you know about that? Is that? Oh yeah. The, the the question of that that if given how nearly infinite, if not infinite, the universe is, that in absolutely every direction, ultimately you should be able to see a star. So why isn't the night sky 
all white, all lit up. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I mean, in essence, I mean, my way of interpreting it, that is Olber's paradox is a good argument that we don't have an infinite universe and, and in essence that we have a time varying universe that there's potentially light from things that hasn't reached us yet or can't reach us. And I think Olber's paradox, yeah, it kind of came from that era when we were still viewing the universe as a potentially a steady state, infinite number of stars out there. Yeah. There's that they also say since the universe is expanding and the rate at which it's expanding is increasing, um, that the result could be, if that continued, that ultimately it keeps expanding faster and faster, and it might mean that that light from distant in the far future, light from distant object, distant objects would never get here, and yep. the night sky that we love so much um, might not look. Now, this might be beyond the lifetime of the Earth, though. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I probably would be, but uh, I, I, yeah, again, that gets gets into the cosmologist. But yeah, there's that possibility that in essence, things start moving away fast enough that the light can never quite make gains against it, make gains against that recession or stretching of the universe, so to speak. You know, I had seen earlier in the chat, uh, someone had said that they were surprised that they didn't know this. I, I'm, I'm guessing this is a misinterpretation when we were talking about that light um, wing and about Bernoulli's principle that, that, that he said that he didn't realize that that lift was caused by deflection. But the lift that an airplane wing experiences isn't, you made the analogy, but it's not the same thing. You were saying that the, the wing on the optical level had to do with deflecting particles, but 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 an airplane wing, it has something to do with the speed at which the air goes over um, the wing, right? Actually, actually it's the opposite because it, it turns out, as I understand it, um, it's a common misconception that Bernoulli's principle, this idea that air fast going over the top of the wing is faster than going under and that provides the lift. It turns out that there, there, there is a Bernoulli principle contribution, but it is a bit oversimplified. And the way you can think about that is in order for Bernoulli's principle to work, and do we have that wing picture still of a, of a wing in air? That in order for Bernoulli's principle to work, in order for air to be like going faster over the top than the bottom, the shape of the wing has to be asymmetric, that there has to be like a big bulb at the top and relatively flat on the bottom. Now, the fact is, though, if you look at a lot of modern planes, especially fighter jets, they have symmetric wings. The wings have the same shape on the top and the bottom. So there's a little more to it than just Bernoulli's principle. And I try not to say too much about the exact physics of it, but if you think about it, it really has to come down to the fact that there's a momentum transfer. If the, wing's getting a, if the wing is experiencing a force pulling it up, that means that there's some mass of air being driven downward. There has to be some momentum conservation built in there. Ah, so, there has, so maybe it is deflecting off the wing like that, particles of air? Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It, there, there was a nice NASA site. I had to look this up when I was writing my blog post on the, the, the wing of light, just, be, just for that reason, that there's a lot of people that will just say Bernoulli force, that's it. But there's a lot more to it. The angle of attack of the wing, if the wing is tilted upward, there's, you're, you're deflecting air. And there's a lot of sort of different forces that are in play on an airplane and the way they interact, um, it gets quite complicated. So I, I try not to say too much about it other than Momentum of conservation. If the wing is going up, something has to be going down. Right. But that, yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> thanks, Greg. You know, I'm sure that we can and will talk a lot longer. Uh, I don't know if anyone will still be listening if we do. But, uh, <laughs> but, but thank you very much for being here. Um, oh, a uh, pleasure. Yeah. And uh, did you have anything else that besides, so uh, Greg Gabor is a, uh, Dr. Sky Skull on Twitter. If you haven't followed him yet, go follow him. Uh, you'll, I, he's a great tweeter that. and you get lots of weird science facts. Um, and sending you back to his blog, which is skullsinthestars.com. Yep. Um, can, can we get another shot of Greg there? So uh, uh, thank you very yeah. much. Do you have anything <laughs> else coming up or anything of interest uh, in physics that, well, how about this? What is the question 
in science or in physics that you most want the answer to? That's kind of what I want to know. Hmm. It took you know, me this long to come up with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it actually comes back to what we were talking about right at the beginning is that that issue of quantum mechanics and how what what does what is what do all these weird quantum effects really imply about the way that the what the way that particles move and what they do and what does that imply about i guess loosely speaking the universe and that's that's been sort of a vexing question for over a hundred years now and it'll probably still remain one but that would be something that i'd just love to see someone make some definitive progress on right well, excellent. Dr. Sky Skull, Greg Gabor at SkullsInTheStars.com. Thank you very much for being here, Greg. Oh, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm Brian Mallow. Once again, I was guest hosting for Dr. Kiki, who's off on maternity leave. And thank you, Dr. Kiki. And congratulations on your 20-day-old son. Um, I will be here next week, and my guest will be Carl Zimmer, who is a science writer that has a number of books out, and he writes for, he has a new article today in the New York Times, and writes for Discover. Um, uh, great writer, and his new book is about viruses, and I'm currently reading a previous book of his about E. coli here, in fact. Uh, it's called Microcosm. Let's get it, actually the wrong direction. There we go. Microcosm by Carl Zimmer. Awesome book. And uh, if you go to sciencecomedian.com, I made a blog post that has some links you can follow. You can see Greg's article about invisibility. And you can also see a very popular article and well-researched blog post that he made recently that's about a... Uh, a scientific swindler in the 1880s, and it's a fascinating story. So uh, I put links to all that, and I'll put some more up there later. But thank you very much, and we'll see you again next time. <laughs>